singing from the top. Bring it up, ah, and let the living waters give our life today, right now. Open up, ah, thank you, Lord. Let the living waters give our lives a start, fresh start. Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. We praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Jesus Christ from whom all Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Um, the announcements. You have any more surprises for us in that little box of yours? <laughs> hey, I'm trying my best. You're doing a good job. I'm peddling. Okay. Wednesdays in the Word, June 29th at 1.30, we're going to be watching um, a video of uh, Jim Cimbala talking about prayer, how our house should be called a house of prayer. Amen. And it's a, it's a great video, and then after that, we're going to be starting another series. We just finished one on the Holy Spirit. This one's going to be on prayer. So we really want to focus on it because this is what we want LCA to be, God's house of prayer. So I encourage you to come. Iron sharpens iron, Saturday, July 2nd at 9 o'clock. Breaking news. Breaking news. Okay, go ahead. We had a, a meeting yesterday. It was great. Oh, great. We had about, I, I, it was great. It, I mean, it was, um, it was so beautiful to see the Lord show up and uh, just open our hearts and, and, and we're able to just focus on a simple a couple of scriptures but yet open up to a whole universe of what God, see you could take one verse in the Bible Amen. and it can open up to volumes of what God is saying for us to do, to be like, to act like. And uh, yesterday we had interaction. It was so beautiful to have the interaction because I don't know about you, but I need to be encouraged. I need my arms upheld by my brothers. And that's why that scripture, iron sharpens iron, that's what happens when you come together like that, especially for brothers, uh, to, to come together and sharpen each other. And, uh, you know, oh, how do you say it? Identify. When we go through struggles, we know we're not alone and we help each other. So uh, we're, we're continuing on and next Saturday we're gonna have another meeting. And uh, we'll do it as, as often as the Lord uh, prompts, uh, prompts me to have that. And I think we're going to try it for twice every twice a month. But we're catching up next week. And I asked them if they, you know, it's 4th of July weekend, but they wanted to come. So Great. Great. thank wow. you, Jesus. So keep Amen. that in your prayer as the, the men come together, that it would grow. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay, Children's Church, they're not here today. We want to just pray for Levi as he is racing, Lord, that you just keep him safe, focused, protect him, yes, Lord, God. and yes, answer to in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And this is Mission Sunday. Judy doesn't really have an announcement this month, she said, but there is an offering basket there for missions. I've and, got something to say. Oh, okay. And I'll go ahead. Uh, September, I booked the Hoving Home Sisters to come and do the service. Uh, you're going to see miracles right in front of your eyes of a, a, a mission that we support right here in America, by the way, right on, on our do sons and daughters that are out here literally dying in the streets. Uh, you'll be able to see how God takes them and makes them brand new. And they're going to come sing and testify 
right in front of you here. So that's Labor Day weekend, right? A Labor Day weekend. Uh, the Hoving Home of the New Jersey House will be here, and it's going to be a glorious event. So if you know anybody that's struggling, that would be a good day Amen. to invite them to church to hear what God can do. It's no secret. No, it's not. Um, so ba if you have baby bottles, please give them to Carrie or Judy today. And Holy Grounds, after church, come downstairs and have some koinonia. God bless you guys. Amen. Huh. Okay, it's time for the offering. You can bring your offering down and uh, say hello to somebody on the way back. Just remember, you can't outgive God, no matter how hard you try. God will always outdo you. It's so beautiful. I flew, I went up to uh, Staten Island on Friday. Uh, Thursday, I had palpitations in my heart. I had what they call an AFib event. That's where your heart goes a little south and a little east and west all at the same time. And it definitely gets your attention. So uh, my watch alerted me. I have an AFib app on here. And it said, you have an AFib, first time ever. And uh, I called my cardiologist and he strapped me up, wired me up, and I wore a device for 48 hours. And he's gonna take a hard look at that tomorrow. So I, I would, uh, I'd ask you for prayer for that as I uh, get older and uh, things happen, but God's always on the throne. And he always makes it exciting, by the way. But I, I went up to Staten Island on Friday and I was at a daycare center for adults that are really challenged. And uh, man, it was a battle getting there. I mean, traffic, people screaming at you, New York drivers yelling at your face. And you, you, you try to park in a sardine can where there's no parking spaces. And I had to load in equipment and all this while I'm strapped up with a heart monitor. And uh, I went in there and I looked at their faces and uh, I knew why I was there. And everything was worth it. And so I took them on a little musical journey. They were dancing. They started off dancing because I started off with the doo-wop. And uh, man, they were twisting the night away. And then I kind of dovetailed it down to praise and worship. And then I got their attention with, uh, if you were to die today, where are you going? And it got real quiet. And then I uh, kind of, God had me share about heaven. And uh, by the time we got through, man, they all said the prayer and they were weeping and crying. And, and I, that, that was my paycheck. And so what I was telling you earlier, you can't outgive God. That's what I mean. No matter what you do, whether you give him your time, energy, resources, you can't outgive him. He'll always give it down, pressed together, shaken together and running over. And your tires will last longer. A gallon of gas will go further. Your health will live longer. He'll just take care of every area. And he says, God in scripture tells you, test him in this. Yes. <laughs> test him. He wants you to test him to see if he can't pour out a blessing so big that you can't contain it. Carrie, would you pray over the offering, brother, please? Father God, we come today just to praise you with our offering. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with your son. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with your son. Yes, God. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, stand and go to praise and worship. Hey, before I start this, hold it, guys. Hold it. Hold it. Uh, Y'all heard me sing this song uh, by Tommy Walker. Um, he knows my name. And I told you the story about Tommy, how he wrote that in an orphanage in the Philippines when all these little kids came up. Uh, uh, asking him, hey, what's my name? And he, and he went and wrote that song uh, about how God knows our name. And uh, so I said, let me put together a Tommy Walker set. So this is a little up and at him and it's praising right in front of you. And uh, Tommy went in the studio with a lot of young, young people. So let this uh, minister to you as we sing. The words will be on the bottom. It's all Tommy Walker songs. And uh, notice the faces in the last song before we go to the anointing of oil. Notice the faces of the young people singing praise and worship. Thank you, Father, for this today. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing to the Lord.
Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, my song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, Saints adore thee, casting down their crowns around the glassy sea. Only thou art holy, beside perfect in power, in love and purity. Power, power, wonder work in power 
the church. What a great old hymn. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, and the glory, revive us. Yes, Lord. Revive us, Lord. God, for the spirit of life who has shown us our Savior and banished our night. Hallelujah, and the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, and the glory. Revive us again. Woo! All glory. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has taken our sins and cleansed every face in this next video before we go to the anointing of oil let it bless you 16 year old boy wrote this hymn years ago I know thou art mine for thee
right now, Lord. Right now. Right now. Right now. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. I think of that 16-year-old boy that wrote that. What was he thinking? How precious. When we think of young people today, that a boy that young could write that beautiful hymn. Lord, we just uh, come before you with all of our needs this morning. We look at the world and our head is spinning. We don't know how you can handle it all. But nothing tilts your crown. Yet you care for each sparrow on the ground. And you number the, each hair on our head. Enormous is your love. Nearer, my God, to thee, we ask you right now, in Jesus' name, to do a work here with our prayer requests. Reading from James, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The affected fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you line up, let's come up and pray this morning. And like I said, I'm gonna need you to pray with me. Pray for me too, because I got uh, issues and tissues, but I'd be amiss if I don't ask you for prayer.
Everybody extend your hands up, brother Pete, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for my brother. Lord, thank you that you know him. Lord, I pray right now that uh, Fanny Crosby prayer, that right now in his mind's eye, he would see you, Jesus, that you would touch his eyes and heal him. He showed himself to the physicians. Now he's going to another one. But we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would heal our brother's eyes and he would begin to see you yes. everywhere. Hallelujah. Yeah, just like Fanny Crosby said, I want to see you, Jesus. Let that happen right now. Clear up his vision. And Lord, just uh, guide him as he's driving, as he's working, and let it slowly clear up. But we pray right now in the name of Jesus. We clear vision in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord, I thank you for Sister Sarah. She comes up here by faith. Asking for healing, Lord, you know everything about every cell in her body. Pray that your blood would flow through her veins and heal every cell. And heal her from her head to her toes. Thank you for a fellowship that you're working in her life and how you work with us each uh, uniquely and, and for our unique needs. Lord, that we can be ourselves in you. You use our gifts and abilities. So we pray that you touch her right now.
that you know every intricate part, Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you touch whatever is out of whack and past this body, Lord, and you make it right, Lord, because you know it so well. Touch Brother Fred, too. He's been limping and bumping. We pray to get healing right now in Jesus' name. From his head to his toe. Yeah. Thank you for his fellowship here in the church. We'll be sure to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Amen. Lord, for Thank our you. pastor. Thank you. There it is, right there. Double dose. <laughs> Brother Kerry, what'd you come up for? Oh, you did. Oh, I thought you were coming up. Well, touch my brother, too. Okay. Yes, Lord. Lord, we ask you to touch Judy from her head to her toe. Give her a fresh anointing, a fresh filling of your spirit and power. Father God, we just pray for the Cornelius family that you dump love all over that house, Lord Jesus, and that everybody would know it's you and give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sister Melly. go to the book, let's uh, sing one more song to kind of tenderize our hearts for what he's about to do. And remember, he's on the throne and there's none like him. Let's sing with Brother Lenny this morning. Thank you, Jesus. There is none like you. No one. There is none like you. 
Yes, I can search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. Thank you, Jesus. I can search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none. passed out some sheets on your seat. I hope you took it home and, uh, and got a chance to look it over. Uh, Jesus in every book of the Bible. You look at that list on the screen there. Alpha, Omega, Lamb of God, Mighty God, King of Kings, Everlasting Father, Messiah, Light of the World, Deliverer, Son of Man, the Good Shepherd, Son of God, Anointed One. But every book of the Bible He's listed. It's a road map, all pointing to Jesus. So take that and, you know what would be good to get a cup of coffee or whatever your beverage you like in the morning? Just sit in a quiet little spot in your house or on your porch or in the yard and just when the quietness of the morning sun is coming up, just uh, go over that and uh, just uh, let the Word of God just melt you. God's Word is, is everything that we need. I remember going to a pastor friend of mine one day, and I said, hey, my friend Leo, I said, hey, Leo, man, I'm having all these problems, man. I just wanted to talk to you. Maybe you could give me some counsel. And he took the, his Bible and he went, here. Oh. <laughs> Dive in. That's all you need. So last week we were in the last part of Acts chapter 6 and then chapter 7. We learned about Stephen and how he, the Lord used him to share the gospel fearlessly depending on the Holy Spirit to give him the words. We saw how Stephen upset the religious people. Ooh, they got hot. And they brought him before the council, the same council that the apostles stood before and the same council that condemned Jesus to death. Wow. Stephen used the open door given to him by the high priest and in, very, in a very detailed statement, he reviewed the history of the Israelites. I mean, he read them up one side and down the other and how they continually rejected God, his prophets, and then Jesus, their Messiah. I find it interesting that in their very own court, the truth Stephen spoke brought conviction on them. When Stephen told them, it made them angry, cut to the heart. They rushed him and stoned him until he fell asleep. Fell asleep. Did you get that? Yes. You know Jesus here this morning? When we fall asleep. Someday you're going to read about maybe, uh, you know, that could happen to me. I had them palpitations the other day. I was sitting in the chair when it happened. And what was, you know, when, when your heart goes off rhythm, it gets your attention immediately because you stop whatever you're doing and you go, that don't feel right. And then automatically think, is this it? It's great. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not great to go through that, but what it is, it's a heart check, a heart check. You get it? Is my heart right? Am I going to fall asleep right now? And the thing to know is, do you know him today? That's the most important thing in this room right now, that you know that you know that your heart is right with God. Because that can happen to anyone at any moment. Pistol Pete Maravich, a famous NBA ball player, was playing ball with James Dobson one time. They were playing a pickup game, just the two of them. And Pete had heart issues since he was a young kid. 
went in the NBA and was known as Pistol Pete because he would shoot from his hip and make the baskets. He was phenomenal. So James Dobson said they were playing ball. They were just messing around in this gym. And, and James Dobson turned around, and before he turned back, P Pete was on the floor, already dead. That quick. <laughs> and he, James Dobson said he went home and told his son on the bed that night, said, be, be, right, be ready, be right with God, please. Be there. That's what he told him. Be there. Be in heaven. Because it can come in the twinkling of an eye. You know, wow. I find it interesting that in their very own court, the truth Stephen spoke brought conviction on them. What Stephen told them made them angry, it cut them to the heart, and they rushed him and stoned him, and then Stephen fell asleep. Stephen's face was glowing like an angel. And he had a vision of his Lord and Savior standing at the right hand of God, waiting to receive the first martyr into heaven. All this happened while Saul was eyeballing them. He was watching. People watch you, you know that? You know, I could run into the package store down here and come out with a brown bag and somebody say, hey, pa Pastor, I saw you come out of that liquor store. What was, you, what was in that bag? <laughs> People know me. I mean, I'm in a restaurant and somebody says, aren't you Santos, the guy that sings that doo-wop? I, I never met the person, but they knew who I was. And it ever reminds me that I'm a witness <laughs> walk circumspectly be very careful on what you dive into what you take as counsel yes. who do you speak to mm -hmm. be very careful uh, my pastor used to have a saying don't expect what you don't inspect you can have that for free I'll give it to you remember that saying don't expect what you don't inspect because it, it can look good smell good taste good but is it good God tells you to be a fruit inspector and so the life lessons from last week were number one bloom where you planted don't be church hopping you ever see church hoppers number one number two number three it's like they're doing a dance God's saying grow where you planted don't rip up the roots number two God will give you the words to say Number three, wear the Lord's countenance. That's why <laughs> I could see my pastor now. Well, he had a rugged group. You know, he had a drug program, but he would give him the Lord. He goes, smile if you love Jesus, because some of those faces, boy, they would be looking at him. And man, they looked like they were going to the electric chair. <laughs> Number four, always look up. Isaiah did it. He looked up, and what did he do? He saw the Lord. Number five, be a living sacrifice. So uh, again, dive into that sheet right there. It's worth your attention. So now let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts. We'll be continuing on in chapter eight in verse one. This is what it says. Now Saul was consenting to his death at the time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles, unquote. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Uh, enlighten us, speak to our hearts, let your Holy Spirit do the work that you want to desperately do with each one of us, Lord. Sometimes you use little things to get our attention, but let us uh, see the relevancy of what your word says, even in the culture that we're in right now. Interesting how all this is happening right in front of us. And we'll be sure to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Saul, who was a member of the council, approved of the stoning of Stephen. I believe the witnesses of Stephen was, uh, the, wit the witness that he saw was impactful to Saul. And that God used Stephen's life to prepare Saul for his Damascus Road experience, which we'll learn about in the next chapter, chapter 9. Saul had seen many people die. He lived in the Roman Empire. I think Saul was being convicted by Stephen's death. Saul probably never seen anyone die like Stephen with a heart of love, forgiveness, and a steadfast focus on his eternal home. Who was that guy that used to say that? Keep your eyes on the prize. Or whatever it is, we know our prize. 
thank God, my eternal home. In fact, we'll, we'll sing about that at the end of the lesson. I think that it stuck like glue inside of Saul and he wrestled with it. As we have seen in our study so far, when the church increases, persecution also increases. We saw it happen with Stephen. Now we see the persecution spreading to the church. The outline of the book of Acts is found in Acts 1.8, where we read that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth, unquote. So Acts 8.1 is the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in Acts 1.8. Interesting. If we follow the commandment of Jesus in Acts 1.8, we can expect the result in Acts 8.1. We can expect to be persecuted for sharing our faith. There will be some sort of pushback, persecution. The Lord is using persecution to spread the message of the good news. How apropos right now, I just got a message from Homeland Security because I'm tied into the network, because I'm a chaplain, I'm a federal law enforcement chaplain. A, a message of warning to churches to be on guard right now, because we're in the crosshairs. Just like this book is talking about right now, but everything that's going on. So if you see something, say something. The Lord is using the persecution to spread the message of the good news. So strap in, put on your seatbelt. God is going to shake and bake us right now. Right now in America, right here in Forked River, New Jersey. The Greek word here is, well, the chapter is the beginning of what is called the dispersion. The Greek word here is diaspora. It means to scatter about. It means to scatter seed as a farmer would when he's planting crops, not haphazardly, but strategically in order for them to grow and produce effectively. This is what the Lord did with those early disciples. He placed them right where he wanted them. The church knew that Jesus told them to go to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. They were probably wondering how they could accomplish that. They might have been organizing missionary teams, but the Lord took care of the plan for them. The Lord will and purpose, his will and his purpose will be fulfilled. The other day when I went to Staten Island, I, you know, for a while I was going, what am I doing driving all the way up here in this craziness for like 10 people? There was, there was 15 in the room. But when I got there, <laughs> I shut up. And I knew, I said, thank you, Jesus, that I didn't kick hands and complain. Well, I did complain, but the Lord knows that I'm like that. But I, but I went, that's the point. I showed up. So next time I'll be a little more happy about it. The disciples were being driven out of Jerusalem because of the persecution for the purpose of being witnesses to him in Judea, Samaria. And the Lord was leading and guiding them through it all. The important thing for us to remember is that God has a purpose for everything that happens in our lives. Can you just imagine how these disciples must have felt leaving their homes in the security of their newly formed church? Sometimes the Lord takes us on a ride that is not a comfortable one. It causes us to grow and be stretched just like this little fella. See him on the screen? That's the LCA Gumby. Come on, let's do some stretching. Have you ever felt like that? You're being stretched? What was that stuff called, silly putty? Remember that stuff? Like the Lord was bringing you way out of your comfort zone. I've been there and, and being here at LCA has caused me to feel like that. It causes me to realize that he will get us where he wants us in spite of ourselves and that we can do nothing without him and that we can do all things through him who will strengthen us. Continuing verse two in chapter eight, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial. 
and made a great lamentation over him, unquote. I think that Stephen must have been very loved by the body of believers. They mourned and lamented over him. So many of my friends have departed and gone to be with Jesus over the, these last few years. As Christians, we have sorrow. We miss those people incredibly, Pastor John. They have left big holes in our heart, but we have sorrow with hope. Thank God. There is peace along with our sorrow because we know that it's not over. Our loved ones have just changed addresses and we get to see them again. How glorious is that? The Bible tells us that Stephen fell asleep. We don't die. We just move to our heavenly home. Our lives are eternal. I love the old Jim Reeves song. This earth is not my home. I'm just passing through. We'll get a chance to sing that at the end. Chapter, uh, verse 3 in chapter 8. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house, dragging off men, women, and committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Havoc, unquote, yeah. Havoc is a word used to describe what happens when a wild boar rampages through a garden or an army sweeping through a city and devastating it, disarray, not caring about the outcome. This is exactly what Paul was doing to the church. This refined, cultured, religious scholar, stock of Israel, Hebrew of Hebrews, who sat at the feet of Gamaliel, this excellent student, lost all sense of sanity in his zeal to persecute the church. Last week, we talked about how people often become intolerable when they're under conviction. Because God is speaking to them, they are fighting God. This is probably what happened to Saul. He began fighting and wrestling in his heart, lashing out and doing things that are unbecoming, all beginning with the stoning of Stephen. The early church fled. Notice they didn't run and hide. They preached the word as they went. So as Paul was trying to stomp out the flames of faith in Jerusalem, the opposite happened. He was causing sparks of the gospel to fly and start fires everywhere. I remember years ago, that reminds me here, let me put it up on the screen. That reminds me years ago when I was touring with the rock bands, I was on tour buses and I was a drug addict, so I was always kind of like under the influence. And I, I used to smoke two packs a day, by the way. And I remember falling asleep with the cigarette because when you're high, you're not out. And what did I do with the cigarette? It hit the mattress. And I'm in the Holiday Inn in Hollywood. And I don't know how I woke up, because usually you die from the smoke inhalation. You don't wake up. But I woke up. It was like something woke me up. And the room was full of smoke. The smoke detector's going off. Day, 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 day. And I'm going, oh, man. So I, got, I grabbed a mattress, and I'm dragging it down the hall, down the, uh, uh, the, the fire well, down the stairs, out to the back of the hotel, tried to get it into the dumpster. And, and you, couldn't, you couldn't put the mattress fire out just keep smoking. It was so embarrassing, man. I mean, I stunk up the whole building. That's what knuckleheads do. That's, that's the outcome of a knucklehead. I don't know why I went on to say that, but, but, but I, I could see him trying to stomp out these guys and the sparks are flying everywhere. And that's what happened. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, plant seeds as you go. The persecution did not hinder the church, but it did the opposite. It furthered the work of the church. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you. Verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, unquote. We read about Philip in Acts 6. Like Stephen, he is a powerful reminder that if we're faithful in the little things, God will open up more and more for us to do. By the time we get to Acts 21, we will see that Philip received the title of Philip the evangelist. That is how he's known to this day. Verse six, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse seven, for unclean spirits crying, crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed 
and many who were paralyzed and lame, and the lame were healed. Verse 8, and there was great joy in that city. Repeat after me. There was great joy in that city. There was great joy in that city. What city? Lacey, New Jersey. There was great joy in that city. I think there's a song. I got to find that song. They used to sing it during the Jesus movement. All the girls would say it. Just had the woman say that right now. There was great joy in that city. Go ahead, sisters. One more time. Yeah, it sounds good when the sisters say it. I'm just just kind of joyful, unquote. Philip de not only declared God's word, but he also demonstrated God's power by performing miracles. God is still in the miracle working business today. Do you believe that? Yes. By the prayer line I had this morning, I, do, I know you believe that. Yes. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Right. Jeremiah 32, 27 tells us, Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh, is there anything too hard for me? Unquote. The people gave heed to the word because they saw miracles. And by believing the word, they were saved. The word gospel means good news. Wherever the gospel is preached and received, great joy abounds. So you could say God is not a killjoy. God is the king of joy. God is the giver of joy. Do you need joy here this morning? Remember, Jesus, others, and yourself. Joy. We should always have joy, even if we are not happy because of trying circumstances. Boy, we get a chance to practice that now, don't we? It's good, man. We can, we can have the joy of the Lord, and, and, and that's our strength. In Nehemiah 8, it talks about that. I love this picture. See this picture on here? I don't know if you could see it, but see it? That's the Prince of Preachers there. 1859, he had the largest church in the world. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was about 19. And he started, he suffered immense depression, went through a lot of changes. But Spurgeon, when he gave his heart to the Lord, he gave everything. That's why it's so good. That's why I like going to prison because a lot of times when I have the inmates, they're at the bottom. What do they got? They got nothing. To do it called doing time. Yeah. But when God grabs somebody like that, yeah. and you know, there's nothing but hurt and pain in your life. So if you're here this morning and you're struggling, listen to this. He started obeying the Lord and he opened this church, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And whenever he would, they would line up outside waiting for the doors to crack open. One time he came early and he was doing a sound check. They didn't have a sound system like I got here. But notice how the pulpit was elevated between the bottom and the top. And I, and I was in England once and I had to climb up the, the, I almost broke the stairs. It was an old rickety staircase that went up to the pulpit. But they would speak and you could hear them up there and you could hear them down there. So they had it in the middle. And Spurgeon had a real loud booming voice. And one time he was doing a sound check and some guy was downstairs working on something and he got saved just listening to him doing the sound check. If you would cut Spurgeon, he would bleed the Bible. That was, and he coined the phrase, when you get saved, it's like stepping into the hall of joy. Amen. So you leave the dungeon of the basement and you go into the hall of joy. That's what it's like when you give your heart to the Lord. I got the joy, 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 joy. Where? Down in my heart. That's right. And it's there to stay. Amen. When you receive the Lord, you enter into the hall of joy. Verse 9, it says, But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. Verse 10, To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Verse 11. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Unquote. Simon Magus, better known as Simon the Magician, was an occultist. He practiced sorcery, an ancient form of magic, very primitive, astrology, reading clouds etc. There was a release of power through him 
but it was from all of the evil side. He was very famous and considered to be a god by many. His fame had spread to the surrounding regions, and there was even a statue of him in Rome. Listen to this carefully. It's so important. Sorcery is the use of spells, divination, speaking to spirits, and it is clearly condemned by the Bible. The word sorcery in scripture is always used in reference to evil or deceptive practices. Here's a few examples of sorcery in our culture today. And you've seen them out on the street. And sometimes you wonder what's in their head. They don't look right. What's going on? What are they talking about? Some of the examples in our culture today are Ouija boards, fortune tellers, horoscopes, crystal balls, hypnosis. The new age movement is a very accepted form of sorcery. And unfortunately, some of its practices have infiltrated the church. Things like channeling, spiritual dictation, meditation on anything except God's word, Harry Potter, yoga. My friend Warren Smith, and I love Warren because he was, in, he was back in the day, he was, he was in it. I mean, he bled that new age movement. He was like a higher up. The New Age Movement, uh, my friend Warren was heavily involved in the New Age Movement, and after he came to Saving Grace in Jesus, Warren came across a devotional book called Jesus Calling. He was shocked to learn that it was so popular among Christians because it is steeped in New Age ritual and philosophy. The Jesus Calling devotional book caused, caused Warren to write a book called Another Jesus Calling, where he goes in depth and outlines the spiritual dangers of the Jesus Calling book. He wanted to warn the church, and I also would be amiss if I didn't warn you about this deception. Stay away from these things. Do not dabble in this very dangerous spiritual territory. Look at the, look at the screen. This is by a, a pastor, pastor's pastor, who since went on to be in heaven. He uh, was an expository pastoral teacher, and he, he put this up as a quote in one of the books, and, and I, I, was, I was diving into these verses yesterday when I was preparing the message. Listen to what it says. We must, be a, be, we must beware of Satan's counterfeits. He has a counterfeit, he has counterfeit Christians who believe a counterfeit gospel. He encourages a counterfeit righteousness and even a counterfeit church. At the end of the age, Satan will produce a counterfeit Christ. He will produce a counterfeit Christ at the end of the age. Very important, very important to let the Lord minister to your heart and you know, I'm a chaplain with Secret Service, and the, the Secret Service has a way of, they were in charge of the money under the Department of Treasury. Now they're under Homeland Security and they're all complaining about it, but uh, they used to be in the Treasury Department, and their responsibility was to keep the money right because there was a lot of people running presses, making money, and so it was filtered throughout society, and how would you detect a, a phony bill? Well, you know how they did that? Study the real thing. What's the real thing? That book in your lap. Eat it up. Spend time in it. There's a lot of side fills you could go to, like the, the buffet bar at Golden Corral. But keep it simple, man. Stick to the Word of God. Those side fills, they can lead you down a rabbit trail. 2 Corinthians 11, listen to what it says. Beginning in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Unquote. Continuing on in verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, 
both men and women were baptized. Verse 13, then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done, unquote. Simon's faith was not in the God who does miracles, but in the miracles of God. As we shall see in just a few verses, Simon believed. He saw the signs and wonders, but he was not born again. James 2.19 says that even the devils believe in God and they tremble. One can miss heaven by 18 inches. It, you can believe in your head intellectually. You can affirm the theology mentally. But if faith is not in your heart, you are no better shape than the demons in hell. Intellectual faith does not work. Your heart must be touched. Your faith must affect the way you live for your faith without works is dead. Continuing on in verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who were when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit, unquote. We've been talking a lot about this lately. The threefold relationship of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. Number one, the Holy Spirit is the one who draws us to God and convicts us of our sin. Number two, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Number three, the Holy Spirit comes upon us, a P, upon us, a separate event, yes. and empowers us for service. This is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which often is evidenced by speaking in tongues. Yes. We all need to pray for God's power in our lives. Now more than ever, God, I was watching a clip out of L.A. the other night of my brother officers being pelted with fireworks, bottles, rocks, outnumbered, crying on the radio. Send some backup. They were being pummeled by a crowd. I've never seen that in all my years where they were shorthanded like that. Because without backup, they're dead. They are dead. You get mob rule in the streets, that's it. They take over. We need to pray more than ever. This stuff is spreading like wildfire right now. The enemy is having a field day right now. But the church has the power. We have the power right here. It might be small like a nuclear reactor, but it's powerful when the saints come together to pray. It's so beautiful. Look at little Israel. When they were enemies were all around it. And, and, they, and, and I mean, that war in 67, they talked about two guys behind a mound popping up and shooting off uh, rounds to this army that was coming at them. And uh, the army thought that there was a whole other army on the other side of the hill. It was only two guys popping up, going like this. But God made him see an army. Prayer. Prayer is powerful. Pray for God's power. We all need to pray for God's power in our lives. His power so that we can live successful Christian lives and witness it, be a witness for him. Continuing on in verse 18, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Verse 19, saying, give me this power also that anyone whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit, unquote. This shows how close a person could come to salvation and still not be converted. Simon heard the gospel. He saw the miracles, gave a profession of faith in Christ. He was baptized, yet he was never born again. Simon didn't understand his relationship with God. He only sought God for what he might get out of the relationship, sort of like a stolen credit card. 
The scripture does not say so, but there was most likely physical evidence of the power of God when Peter and John laid their hands on these believers. No amount of money can buy salvation, forgiveness of sin, or God's power. These things are only gained by repentance and belief in Jesus Christ as Savior. Simon apparently wanted the ability he was trying to purchase for selfish reasons to have money, power, and to gain prestige. God doesn't give us abilities to enhance our own lives. He grants us gifts so that we may bring him glory by building up others. Salvation's a free gift of God. Continuing on in verse 20, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Verse 21, for you have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of, this, of your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Verse 23, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Verse 24, then Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me, unquote. The wickedness of Simon's heart was revealed by Peter. Peter could not have said it any stronger, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Peter discerned that Simon was poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Simon was most likely bitter because people were turning to the truth of the gospel and he was no longer the big shot in the neighborhood. That's to put it mildly. Uh, you know, he didn't have that position of astonishing the people and having them think he was this great power of God. When Simon was called on the carpet, he didn't say, pray that my heart may be changed. He said, pray that these things won't happen to me. He wasn't interested in having his life corrected. He just wanted to be protected from the consequences of his sin. I remember counseling people that were going to jail. You know, I'd go to the, the, the lockup unit because they'd ask for a pastor and, and, and the church I worked at, I'd have to answer the call. So I'd have to go over to the, 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 the county jail. And I remember, I don't know how many times it happened, but I'd be sitting there and they'd give me the lawyer's room so I could be face to face with the person because I had pastoral clearance to get in. And they'd start crying. Oh man, I'm looking at some serious prison time. I, 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 I need help. And I'd tell them about the Lord. I said, listen, I can't get you out of this sentence that you're looking at, but I'll tell you what, you can get your heart right with God. That's a good place to start. And then God could change your outlook. He might not get you out of this jail time, but you get your heart saved right with God. And that's what, uh, what happened to Simon. Tradition says that he went insane and buried himself alive. Wow. Buried himself alive. We can certainly pray for one. We can certainly pray for one another. But having a relationship with Jesus Christ is so personal. It's up to us to recognize the sin in our lives, repent and pray for the Lord to forgive us. Bitterness, listen to this. Bitterness is a terrible state in which to live. Bitterness corrodes and eats away at us like a cancer. Bitterness willfully holds on to angry feelings. It causes us to be able to break out in anger at any moment. It causes us to be resentful, cynical, harsh, cold, relentless, unpleasant to be around. Any expression of these characteristics is sin against God. The Bible tells us how to deal with bitterness. It gives us the prescription, so to speak. By being kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Great prescription, by the way. We must always be wary of allowing bitter roots to grow in our hearts. Such roots will cause us to fall short of the grace of God. God wants us to live in love, joy, peace, and holiness, not in bitterness. Therefore, the believer must always watch diligently, being on guard against 
the dangers of bitterness. So what do we do? We let go of all bitterness. And if you can't do it on your own, well, of course you can't do it on your own. You need God to help you with that. Verse 25 in chapter 8 of the book of Acts says, So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans, unquote. As the book of Acts unfolds, we'll see the gospel starting its journey. It's so exciting. The church is like, bam, it's on. From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, even in Forked River, New Jersey. The center of the church will move from Antioch to Ephesus and then to Alexandria. Today, I don't think there's any particular center of the church. It's gone to the end of the earth. It's our privilege to be able to continue to spread the good news so that we can, as it says in Acts 5.28, fill our community with our doctrine. <laughs> I love that. Oh man, spread it. What did we learn today? Let's look at the board. The chalkboard, so to speak. Life lessons number one. God stretches us out of our comfort zone. Get that gumbyitis. That's good. Come be. Number two, be faithful in the little things. That's where you start. I remember my pastor friend that went on to heaven when people wanted to get in the ministry. He would say, well, you can start out by cleaning the Ben's room. But pastor, I wasn't thinking of that, man. I want to run that drug and alcohol program, man, and work with all those people. He said, well, start there in the men's room. Let's see how you do. And, you know, either you kick cans and complain or you go, why, sure, Pastor, I'll start right there. I'll be kind. And, and, and I did at one point after I backslid and I was on this program, my, uh, I had to clean the latrines. And how did I clean those latrines? I didn't do the, what was that word that we were using in the last, uh, the, what was it? The Christmas. Yeah, complaining and murmuring. I didn't do that. I was so happy that I got out of that jackpot I was in from being a knucklehead that I'd be in the men's room cleaning the latrines and stuff and singing like, Oh God, be the glory, hallelujah. And I'm cleaning in there and singing. And, and a lot of the guys on the program would come from bad situations and they would do the same thing. They'd be up there slopping the pigs and the cows and they'd be singing songs of joy. And they, they'd come down and circle up for lunch and that's where you circle up and you pray. So... What, what did God show you today? Well, I was down there feeding the horses, man, and, and uh, I'm just so grateful to be here, man. I got a song in my heart. Now, that's how, that's how you start, you see? You start with the little things. Whatever you're going through in your life, God will give you a song in your heart. So be faithful in the little things. Number three, we can have joy in the middle of the trials. Uh, you know, each trial. God can take uh, the lemons and make them into lemonade. Four, God will give you his power. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you. And number five, get rid of it. Dump it. It'll tear you to shreds. Don't let nobody live in your head rent free. You dig it? Because you could be dwelling on that stuff day and night. I'm going to get them. I'm going to fix them. I'm thinking of ways to get them. 24 hours a day, it's spinning in your head. Eating up your energy, your time, your joy. Let it go. Let go and let God. Get rid of all bitterness. So as I said earlier, let's close with that old song. Man, you guys are too young to remember this fella. He's an old cowboy now. You, you might remember him, but he had a voice. But I, I got Ricky Skaggs to sing it because I like Ricky. He's got the joy of the Lord. And let's sing it with Ricky, okay? Come on, Ricky, bring it. This world is not my home. I'm just the passing through. My treasure and my hope is placed beyond the blue. My many friends and kindred have gone on before. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Heaven's not my home, oh Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me, the heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh yeah, glory land, there'll be no dying there. The 
same song that the rest singing everywhere. I heard the voice of them gone on before, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, you know, I have no, no friend like you. If heaven's not my unconditionally. You know all our bumps and bruises, even though we uh, stray off the path like I did. I was such a knucklehead. But your love brought me back. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm a prisoner of your love. I'm addicted to your love, Lord. The agape love that you give. You look beyond all of my faults and you saw your son Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Father, that he nailed himself on the tree for me. Nearer God to thee, that's where I want to be. So if you need to get right with God right now, just right quietly in your head. Remember, yesterday's gone. Tomorrow's not here yet. Whether you're watching on our channel or you're here in the church, just say this simple prayer and mean it in your heart. Say, Dear Father, I come to you now in Jesus' name. And I ask you, Father, forgive me of my sins. I invite your Son, Jesus Christ, into my heart as my Lord and as my Savior. With my mouth, I confess Jesus Christ. And in my heart, I believe that you raised him from the dead. Now, according to your word, I'm born again. I'm saved. All my sins have been forgiven me. I'm yours and you're mine. Help me, Father, to live a life for you from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's where you walk with the King and be a blessing. Now, before I close, I'm going to close with a little different song today. Uh, Tommy Walker wrote this with his, with his daughters. And, uh, this is what it's all about. This room right here where you're sitting, and those are your brothers and sisters sitting next to you. It's a family. And I remember singing that when I first became a believer. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Because I didn't have a family growing up. You know, I got this Spanish name, but I'm German and didn't have no brothers and sisters. At least then I didn't. Now I got five and a brother. God's got something else. I don't know how God did that. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. But, but uh, Tommy wrote this song and they're in the living room singing it. So I want you to learn it. And get it down in your spirit today before you go home, knowing that you're a part of the family of God. And uh, Tommy has a way with words. I mean, he's just so anointed as a worship singer. But check out the faces again 
and let this song minister to your heart. You guys ready? <laughs> Sing and you're twisting my arm. We'll close with our we'll close with our song. God bless you. Have a great summer. Hot. Be careful out there. All right. Drink a lot of water. It's hot. Don't lock no critters or people in a hot car. Remember that. Thank you, Jesus.
Lord, bless everybody. Get them home safe. Give them a great day. Let those miracles take place, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Read it. When there comes a time, I falter and I call upon your name. And I know that you are faithful to remove my guilt and shame. Faithful to love us, you, Lord, are faithful, faithful and true every day. You, Lord, are faithful, so faithful and true, faithful to love us, you, Dr. Cook, walk with the king and be a blessing. 